house tonight. Uh, got a couple of birthdays we want to recognize. Uh, Brother Baker's got a birthday tomorrow, and Sister Anna Grace got a birthday today. So I think she's hers is today, right? right? So that means she's older than him because his is not coming until tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> but we want to sing happy birthday to both of those as well. And uh, happy birthday to you. Many, many more. Uh, Olivia's going to be having them one Saturday, but she's, got, she's down to the, at the beach this week, so with her grandma, I think. Uh, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. Yes, you know, the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Yes, we need to lift him up. You know, we, uh, yes. we had some revival services, but, you know, revival will change. And, you know, we've got a lot to praise the Lord for. He gave, God gave his only begotten son that we may have life and have it everlasting. We've got a lot to praise God for. Praise God. As we open in prayer, uh, we've got a lot to pray about. Continue to pray for Brother Zach's healing of his arm. He's believing for complete healing of that arm. Right. God's healed him before, and he can do it again. Yes, uh, also, continue to pray for uh, Brother Trenton, uh, Brother and Sister Ball, Sister Taylor, Sister Jane, Sister Angela and her family. Uh, also, pray for Sister Audrey. She, Audrey, she's having an asthma attack. Uh, God is able to touch her and help her. Pray for uh, Brother Josh and Sister Becky. They're traveling, uh, spreading the gospel. Uh, pray for uh, Tracy. Uh, continue praying for her and her family. Pray for uh, Brother Curtis and Sister Lisa Teague. Pray for, uh, and Sister Blanche has a very urgent prayer request that she, the Lord knows all about. But, you know, God's a great God, and he knows every need we have before we even ask it. But we'll get, uh, Sister Granny wants to be anointed, so the pastor's going to anoint Sister Granny. But we'll let's take all these requests into the Lord. Granny, I'm going to come right there where you are. Granny, he's going to come to you. Thank you, Brother Charlie. Precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord God, for another opportunity to come in your house again tonight. Lord, I thank you for your blessings, Lord. I thank you for everything you've done, everything you're going to do. Lord, I thank you for these prayer requests tonight, Lord God. Lord God, we know in your word you said that you are the Lord and you're, you're the one that heals, Lord God. Lord, there's several that need healing tonight. Touch this granny and her body. Heal her, Lord God. Heal Brother Zach's arm, Lord God. I know God, you're able to reach down and heal him, Lord, completely, Lord God. Lord, heal Brother Ball, Sister Ball, Lord God, Sister Jane, Sister Taylor. Lord God, heal Brother First, Sister Lisa, Lord God, you Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, God. Minister, Lord God, to each heaven thing, Lord God. Touch, Lord God, and it's got to touch, Lord God. Lord, that's got to heal, Lord God. Sister James, Lord God, touch Sister Angela, Lord God. Touch her and her family, Lord God. Sister Betty Gary, Lord God. Lord, I thank you, and I praise you, Lord, for everything you've done, everything you want to do, Lord God. Praise your holy name, Lord. That's got to just minister in a mighty way, Lord God, for everything said and done, Lord God. Lord God, touch Sister Aldi, Lord God. That's got you just heal this. Lord God, Lord, ask God you to touch and bless and help and have your way, Lord God. Praise your holy name, praise your holy name. Hallelujah, thank you, Lord God, for everything. Touch our pastor tonight, Lord, he brings the word before us, Lord. Adore him in a mighty way. Help him, Lord God. Praise God, hallelujah, thank you, Lord God, for everything. You've done everything you're going to do, Lord. Have your way, Lord God. Praise your holy name, Lord God. Touch your God, your brother, King, ministry, Lord God. God, you're doing great mighty work, Lord God. Praise your holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, uh, oh Brother Senior and Sister Chastity, they're doing their part. They brought Chris to church tonight. And uh, Brother Nathan, Sister Brianna, they brought uh, Colin tonight. Right. You know, we got, if we everybody will bring somebody, we'll have a whole lot more people at church. Uh, so they're, it's good to have Brother and Sister Albright back. I know they had a trip, and I know they're glad to be back. Yes. Praise God. You know, I, I thought about what to say tonight, and you ever heard of, you know, people ask you, what's on your mind? You know, a lot of people say, what's on your mind? 
Well, Philippians 2 and 5 says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We should have Jesus on our mind. You know, Romans 12, 1 and 2, he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And verse 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Isaiah 26 and 3, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. So if somebody asks you what's on your mind, say, Jesus, that's the best thing you can have on your mind. Praise God. This time we'll receive our tithe and offering, and our uh, offering will be going to Brother and uh, Sister uh, Curtis Teague. We'll uh, get the ushers come at this time. Okay, Brother Matthew, would you pray over this time of service? God richly bless you when you're given tonight. At this time, I have Sister Amy and the girls come and we'll have praise and worship. Let's stand, please. Praise the Lord. Thankful to be in my father's house. I know you are too. Um, I was reading last night in Isaiah. I don't know the exact, um, I can't quote it it but in Isaiah where it says that violence will no no more be in the land and I'm looking forward to that day aren't you there's so much going on so much chaos but he's worthy of our praise he's going to take us out of this world one day and it could be today I, I love him let's sing unto him we're going to start with I will enter his gates
God, what a mighty God we serve. I just thank God for his goodness, his mercy, and his love to us. You know, we could be at home tonight. We could be in a hospital sick. We could be anywhere. But thank God we're at church. Now let's lift up his holy name tonight. I'm going to turn the service to Pastor Brother Shelton. Amen. Give God a hand to praise tonight. Brother Charlie took the words right out of my mouth. What did you come here to do? Did you come for a social gathering? Did you come to see or be seen? Did you come just out of obligation that it's church night and I've got to go? Would you come to worship the name of the Lord? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, church. I, got it. I feel the Lord here tonight. Oh, dear God, he took those words right out of my mouth. He and I are on the same page. Amen. We've come to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So glad to be saved, so glad that we're able to be in church. I'd rather be here than any place I know. You say, well, Brother Shep, would you rather be here than out back? Yes, I would. I can go to out back another day. I'd rather be in church. Would you rather be here than be at home in your recliner? Yes, I'd rather be here. Would you rather be here than be shopping? Oh, come on, I don't even have to answer that one. There's no place like the house of God. No place on the earth like the church. That place, the house of God where the church meets. We're glad to see all of you here tonight. So good to have the Albrights back with us. So good to have our brother Dean, Sister Chastain, and their family back with us. We missed all of them on Sunday. Good to have Chris with us. He's my little buddy back there. I love this young man. Uh, he, he's been here before. He comes and stays the summer sometimes with them. And uh, I told him I was looking at pictures this week up here, I believe on Monday, going back through some old pictures, and I uh, found a picture of me and him when he was just a little bitty fellow standing right there, and we were preaching, and he was standing there beside me. Maybe he was preaching, I was standing there helping him, I don't know, but we were up there together, and uh, I'm glad he's here. Give him a hand, and Colin, good to see Colin back there. Give him a hand. Appreciate him coming. It's good to have Branson back. I miss Branson. Glad he's back in the house of God. All of you don't want to miss anybody. We're glad that you're here tonight. Amen? Amen. The Lord's good to us, isn't he? He's changed our lives. He's changed our desires. And we're glad to be born again, glad to be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. Let's keep praying for Brother Zach's arm. He needs the healing, but he knows the healer. There's others in the church that need healing, not just this church, other churches that need a healing, a miracle from God. But I've read this Bible through more than one time, and I've never found where there's anything impossible with God except where men can't believe. And I believe Brother Zach believes in the healing power of God, and I believe you do. And if we can believe it, the Bible said all things are possible to him that believes. We've got to have faith in God. Amen. We want to get into the word of the Lord tonight. If you have your Bibles, let's stand, please. I have a lot to say, and I just don't have a lot of time to say it in. It seems like when you get to preaching, that clock just wants to run away with you. That's why I take my glasses off. I can't really see it that good. And, uh, and when I have my glasses on, I try not to look at it. Boy, they put it right there, didn't they? I mean, it's just right there. I want to pray for that. <laughs> All those watching online tonight, God bless you for being a part of this service uh, I've said it before, and I don't use this, don't use this media ministry as a tool to stay home. I don't believe you do. I'm just telling you, don't use that and say, "Well, I can just stay home because I can watch it online." It's not like being here. I said it's not the same as being here, and uh, we want to be in God's house if we're able to be in God's house. If you'll go to Second Samuel chapter twelve tonight. We'll hold our place there, and we're going over to Matthew chapter 7, and begin reading in verse 3. I covet your prayers tonight. You folks helped me just drag that out of here on Sunday night, and I thought I was going to choke to death up here, and, uh, but you folks stayed in there with me, and I appreciate that. You didn't come to hear me, you come to hear the Word of God. I like what Brother Clendenin said one time, said he went to church and there's two little girls sitting in front of him, two teenagers just talking the whole time. And he said, I leaned up and tapped them on the shoulder and said, listen, I didn't come to hear you talk. I come to hear the word of God. 
That's what we're here for, to hear the word of God. Amen. Sometimes we can sure butcher it, but God helps us, and thank you for helping us. Amen. All right. 2 Samuel chapter 12, hold your spot, and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. I'm going to preach a wholeness message to you tonight. The Bible says, Jesus said, And why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye? A moat is a speck. A moat is a splinter, something very small. Anybody ever got a splinter in your hand? You couldn't even hardly see it, but you knew it was there. He said, why are you so occupied with the splinter, the speck, in your brother's eye, but considers not the beam that is in thine own eye? Anybody ever seen a tractor trailer pulling lumber? Why are you so concerned about that little speck in somebody else's eye when you've got a tractor trailer load of lumber in yours? I knew y'all weren't going to help me much tonight with this, and I ain't even got started yet. He said, Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. O oh God. He said, thou hypocrite. A hypocrite is a pretender. Somebody that plays a part, plays a role. First, cast out the beam out of thine own eye. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat, the splinter, out of thy brother's eye. Now let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And we'll begin reading in verse 1 there. Bible said, The Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little wee lamb, which he had boiled and nourished up, and it grew up together with him. And with his children it did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared, or he refused to take of his own flock, and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But took the poor man's lamb, and dressed it for the man that was come to him. In other words, he, he kept everything he had. He took this one man, this poor man's wee little lamb, he killed it, he prepared it, and he offered it to this traveling man. The Bible says in verse 5, And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. David didn't realize he was looking in, the own, in his own mirror. David didn't realize he was pointing his finger at his own self. He said, the man that's done this shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom. And gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if it had been too little, I would have moreover given unto thee such and such things. Or I would have given you more, even more, than what I have given you. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. And hast taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. He said, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives from before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly. 
And I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the sun. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. And David said unto Nathan, unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. May God add his blessings to his red word tonight. You can be seated for a little while. I'm going to try to be a little more deliberate tonight. I want to preach what I believe God's dealt with my heart in studying and praying and seeking him and his direction. I'm going to preach some wholeness to you here tonight. A lot of times we think about holiness, we think about the external. But tonight we're going to deal with the internal. How many know that we're living in a time where seemingly everyone is pointing the finger at everybody else? I mean, you've got this race pointing the finger at that race. This, this group pointing their finger at that group. That group pointing their finger at this group. And, you know, everybody's finding fault with everything. Everybody's wrong. Everything's wrong. But it ought not to be this way. This crowd points at that crowd and says, you're wrong. That crowd turns around and points at that crowd and says, no, you're the one wrong. And I'm afraid that this secular finger pointing is in our churches today. Now, probably not this church. I would, you know. I'm talking about other churches, you know. This secular finger pointing is in our churches. Christians who point their finger and find fault with others. But Jesus said, why would you be so occupied with your brother who's got just a speck in his eye when you've got that great big beam in your eye, that great big log in your eye? He said, first, deal with that log in your eye. Then you can help that brother or sister in the lo along in the way. In other words, what he's saying is, is you need to stop pointing your fingers at others and take a look in the mirror for yourself. I believe if people would stop pointing the finger in the churches today, and not even in the churches, but in this nation, if everybody stopped pointing the finger and stopped blaming everybody else and, you know, they would say, I'm the one wrong, I believe we might see more peace in the land and I believe we might see revival in the church. We're going to preach about this tonight simply as the Lord talked about what is that in your eye? What is that in your eye? Brother Dean, turn me down just a little bit on the monitor, please. Not much, brother, just a, just a little bit. Thank you, brother. What is that in your eye? I believe that you'll agree with me when it comes to our desire to make things better. We all have the tendency to start by looking at other people than looking in the mirror at ourselves. We're very quick sometimes to demand the change in the lives of other people, but often we're all guilty. I said we're all guilty of recognizing the need for the change in our own lives. We always see what's wrong in other people's families, but we don't see anything wrong with ours. Uh, you know, we see the wrong in other people's children. We see the wrong in other people's grandchildren, but our children and grandchildren do no wrong. Say amen to me. We're quick to see the weaknesses and the deficiencies uh, and even the sin in someone else's life uh, but many times we're blind to our own failures uh, and we're blind to our own sins. It, it seems as though our nature to try to remove the splinter uh, from our brother's eye uh, while we ignore the very log that is in our own eye. I'm telling you tonight the greatest challenge that we have is always keeping our own selves under control. I'm telling you I'm a full-time job for me. And you are a full-time job for you. 
Our greatest challenge is to keep our feet off the broad road uh, that leads to destruction and keep our feet uh, on that straight and narrow path that will lead to eternal life. Here we find that Jesus is dealing with this problem in his message on the mount. Jesus himself pointed out uh, to us the necessity to pay attention uh, to our own spiritual condition uh, and to make sure that we don't take it upon ourselves uh, to judge and criticize and to condemn others. Can you say amen? Now listen, I know, again, not in this church probably, but we have a lot of spiritual busybodies in the churches today. We have a lot of spiritual police in the church today uh, who are always looking to criticize, always looking to find fault, uh, always looking to condemn somebody else, uh, but they never are able to see their own faults or able to see uh, their own shortcomings or able to see their own sins. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 3 through 5, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? He said, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. I'm telling you, this is a hard truth for us to admit. And some folks never will. It's a hard lesson for us to learn. And it's even harder at times to, to make this active in our lives. It's always easier to look out. I said it's always easier to look out at somebody else uh, and find their fault uh, than it is to turn that mirror on ourselves uh, and to see our faults ourselves. Can you say amen? It's hard because it requires us to come to some sobering truths uh, about who we really are on the inside. I believe that if every one of us starts sweeping uh, around the front door of our own soul, uh, it may bring us face to face uh, with some things in our own lives that need to be cleaned up. And because of this truth, you listen to me tonight, uh, because of this truth, uh, we must all be careful how we criticize, uh, and we must all be careful how we condemn, uh, and we must all be careful how we judge our brothers and our sisters. Now listen, before you get mad at me, I, I'm telling you, God always preaches to me first before he ever preaches to you. In John chapter 8, I read about that woman caught in the act of adultery. And the Bible said how those hypocrites, those self-righteous Pharisees, you know, if you go back and study the Word of God, you'll find that Jesus was hard uh, on those self-righteous Pharisees. It wasn't the sinners that he was hard on. Uh, the sinners, he expressed his love for them, and, and he looked upon them as sheep having no shepherd. Uh, I'm telling you some of the choice words that he used uh, to describe those Pharisees. He calls them vipers. Uh, come on now, he called them snakes. Uh, I mean, he told them exactly what they were. The Bible said these religious hypocrites, these self-righteous Pharisees, uh, they bring this woman caught in the act of adultery, uh, and I can see her there on the ground. Uh, I can see them just cast her in the dust, and, and how they probably got a stone in each hand. And they're ready to take her life. They're ready to stone uh, this woman. Amen. Uh, they're very quick to judge her sins. They're very quick to draw the stone back and to take her life because of how she's living the condition that she's in. But I'm telling you, when the Word of God spoke, when Jesus spoke to them, every one of them, from the eldest to the youngest, they all dropped their stones and they went away with their heads hanging down. And there Jesus stands before this sinful 
woman. This woman bound up in that world. Jesus did not condemn her, but rather Jesus reached out and he saved that woman that day. I'm just telling you, the Bible tells us we're not to live like the Pharisees, but we're to live like Jesus Christ. We're to walk like he walked. We're to love like he loved. We're to live like he lived. Somebody give him a hand of praise tonight. Hallelujah. Ah, God, I believe that we must drop the rocks in our churches today and allow God to begin to deal with us again. Allow God to begin to deal with the log that's in our eye. Uh, before we can help anybody else uh, along this journey of serving the Lord. I don't know of a greater example that we find in the Word of God than what we've read here in 2 Samuel chapter 12. The Bible said that when Nathan the prophet confronts King David uh, with his sin here, uh, we're familiar with King David. Everybody who's been in church any time at all, uh, they know who King David is. They know how God took him from the shepherd's life and, and made him king over all of Israel. This was a man that in every way that God had blessed. His relationship with God was so strong. And he loved the Lord in such a manner that God said, I have found me a man after mine own heart. There's no denying the fact that God loved David and David loved God. Listen to me. I'd love for God to be able to look at my life and say like he said of Job, there's none like him in the land. I'd love for God to look at my life and be able to say like he did of David, I have found me a man after mine own heart. How many feel that way tonight? I don't want to just be a church goer. I don't want to just be a member of the local church. I don't want to just sing in the choir. But I want to be a man that loves the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. That the Lord can say they love me above everything else somebody give him praise tonight oh God Woo! David's been so blessed by God God loved David and David loved God as a sign of God's love for David God made a promise to him that one of his descendants would always sit upon the throne of Israel. But yet with all that God had gave to David, all of God's blessings in his life, all the promises he's poured out upon this king. The Bible shows us how that David took his eyes off the Lord. I said he took his eyes off the Lord. And the Bible tells us he got his eyes on someone uh, that he should not be looking at. Let this be a reminder for every man and every woman, every child of God, that we must be sure that we set no wicked thing before our eyes. There are people that are not in church today because they set wickedness before their eyes and it got into their heart and they turned from God Almighty. David failed God by being in the wrong place at the wrong time and looking at the wrong thing and it cost him the rest of his life the Bible said in 2 Samuel chapter 11 when it's time for the kings to go forth into battle I don't know why I don't know the Bible doesn't tell us but for some reason David this mighty warrior who was always on the battlefield who was a, a man of war the Bible says but on this particular occasion David decided to stay behind and tarry in Jerusalem at evening time he arose from his bed he went out onto the roof of his house and there off in a distance he saw Bathsheba bathing and he began to lust after her and then he sent for her and then he committed adultery and sinned against God you know how he would go on and have her husband Uriah killed and then he would take Bathsheba to be his own wife brother Albright it's hard for me to understand that 
It's hard for me to understand how a man like this that walked that close to God yet listen to me friend this was a man that loved God this was a man that served God this was a man that was faithful to God this was a man who had seen the mighty power of God yet one slip up yet one wrong choice and it would cost him I'm just telling you friend we can't afford to take a day off in our service to the Lord we can't afford to take a night off of prayer we can't afford to take off a night of being in the Bible I'm going to go a step further and say if all possible we can't afford to miss church but we've got to stay sharp and stay close to God one wrong choice, one wrong move could cost us in our walk with God David made a wrong choice David should have been on the battlefield. David should have been fighting like he always had, but he stayed behind and he sinned against God Almighty. I can't afford to take a day off when it comes to serving God. I can't afford to miss a time of prayer. I can't afford to miss a time of being in the Bible. I can't afford to miss when it comes to the things of God. Now David's gotten this woman pregnant who's another man's wife. Now he's had her husband killed and brought her into himself. And now he's married this woman. In doing this, David broke all five of God's commandments that teach us how we are to treat other people. He committed murder, breaking the sixth commandment. He committed adultery, breaking the seventh commandment. He stole from another man, breaking the Eighth Commandment. He lied and tried to use Uriah to cover up his lie, breaking the Ninth Commandment. He coveted his neighbor's wife, breaking the Tenth Commandment. No wonder James said in James 1 and 15, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. David should have remembered God's warning to, when he gave Cain in Genesis 4 and 7. God said, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. David, a man after God's own heart, has fallen into sin. And now God's going to confront this man of God through the prophet Nathan, through the preacher, with the word of the Lord. Amen. 2 Samuel 12 and 1 says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. When the preacher showed up at David's house, David's first of all glad to see him. He's excited. Nathan had been a close friend of David. Nathan had been an advisor to King David. And David had no clue. He had no idea what kind of message that Nathan is about to preach to him. By this time, nearly a year has passed. David thought everything's covered. David thought I got away with it. Uriah's been buried. Bathsheba's mine. We lost the child, but I still got the woman. Nobody knows anything. David's not looking over his shoulder anymore. David's not looking around, you know, with fear anymore. This thing he's gotten away with. But the Bible said Nathan begins to tell David the story of a very rich man who had everything and how this rich man, he was not able to satisfy his own selfish desires. And so he took the most valuable possession, a wee lamb that a poor man had and left him with nothing. He told him how he stole and took that lamb from that poor man. That poor man loved that little lamb. It was as his own child. That lamb ate at the table with him, fed him from the table, laid on that poor man's bosom. He loved that little lamb. But now David knows that this rich man, what he's done, he stole from the poor man. When that message is over, David rises up. Oh, God, help me here for a little while. David rises up in his own self-righteousness. David is mad now, and David is angry over the sins of this rich man. 
He's not only ready to judge this man and condemn this man who committed such a sin, but he demanded this rich man's going to restore back to that poor man fourfold what is took from him, and then that rich man is going to be executed. Isn't it amazing how quickly David forgot about his own sin? Isn't it amazing how David forgot about that big old four by four or six by six post in his own eye? How quickly he forgot about his sins against God and man. In his haste to judge and condemn someone else, he completely forgot how he had just murdered a man. He forgot how he took another man's wife. He forgot how he sinned against God Almighty. When I read this, Brother Benny, I realize that how quickly David becomes an example to us as people today of God. How quick we are to pass judgment on other people. Oh, come on, not your pretty heads at me tonight. I knew you weren't going to shout much with this, but let me preach it on through here. How quick we are, just like David, to point the finger at somebody else. How quick we are, like those Pharisees, to take up stones in our hands, ready to execute somebody else. How quick we are to criticize and to pass judgment on the other person. Most of the time, without even knowing their situation, and most of the time, not really knowing anything about them at all. We're so quick at times to pass judgment on people. We say, I don't like them. I don't like how they do. I don't like what they do. But listen to me. If you've never walked a mile in their shoes, then you have no right to criticize anything about them. Wave your hands at me tonight and say amen. How fast we move into somebody else's life and things that we see as sin, things that we don't approve of, things that we don't like. And like David, we're merciless sometimes. Listen, I believe Pentecostals are the worst at this. I ain't never been raised in a Baptist church. I ain't never been raised in a Methodist church. I ain't never been raised in any other. I've been raised in a Pentecostal church. And I've seen Pentecostal people who have the dress, the outward right. Amen. But they got a tongue, as Brother Bowling said so long. They can sit on the front porch and use their tongue to turn the stove on in the kitchen. I've watched Pentecostal people who have the outward right, but always critical, always condemning always judging somebody else come on and say amen to me I'm just telling you tonight Jesus said before you're going to criticize somebody else before you're going to condemn another man make sure that you got everything right in your life between you and God then you can help that weaker brother or sister somebody give him a hand of praise tonight oh hold on it's going to get better y'all better be helping me up here tonight we're merciless sometimes. We're ruthless when it comes to other people. We're so quick to shed innocent blood. We're quick to criticize. We're quick to condemn others while we forget those things in our life that we've not been doing right. Amen. I'm glad for the Word of God. I'm glad that the Word exposed David. I'm glad the Word will expose us if we'll let it work on us. There are plenty of people of our, in our churches today who've been carrying stones in their hand again. You know, not this local church. We wouldn't dare do that around here. We always do everything right, don't we? Did I go off camera there? Let me do that. We always do everything right, don't we? Amen. We're quick to criticize. We're fast to condemn somebody else. Oh, God, help me for a little while. I got some more messages. God's been working on my heart. And, you know, so just for the next little while, maybe the next few weeks or so, we just have to buckle up and hold on. God's going to get us somewhere. God's trying to do something in our churches today. God's trying to send revival. But before revival can come, uh, we got to get right with God. I said we got to get right with God Almighty. Uh, and if we'll get right with God and we'll do things according to the Word of God, uh, we'll see the mighty hand of God move in a marvelous way today. 
There are people in our Pentecostal churches uh, who carry stones with them in their hands, uh, ready at any second to stone somebody else, uh, ready to criticize somebody else, uh, ready to condemn somebody else. Come on now and say amen. I, I believe that what we need in this hour uh, is to drop the stones. I, I said let them fall to the dust uh, and then drop on our knees before God uh, and ask God to help us uh, to deal with me. Uh, work on me where I am Lord draw a circle around your life and tell God to fix everything inside of that circle I'm telling you if the church would do it again if we would drop the stones if we would stop being so critical if we would get our tongues sanctified revival would sweep through the churches there would be a change we would see God's mighty hand move Oh, God, help us here tonight. The Bible said where there's strife, where there's envy, where there's division, every evil work is present. That scares me to think about where there's division in a church, where there's envy in a church. Where there's strife among brothers and sisters in the house of God. Every evil and wicked thing the devil's free to come in and do whatever he wants. Every evil thing that he can imagine in that church. I like what the psalmist said in Psalms 133. He said how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the oil poured out upon the head of that high priest Aaron. And that oil runs down upon his beard and down his garments. And the Bible said that when there's that kind of unity in that church, at that place, at that moment, God will protect announce a blessing upon it I'm just telling you friend why don't we throw down the rocks in the churches again why don't we drop the stones and why don't we ask God work on me and me alone Woo! it's me oh Lord standing in the knee of prayer it's not my brother it's not my sister I'm telling you people quit finding fault quit pointing fingers quit criticizing everything quit condemning everybody I'm telling you there'd be more peace in the land and there'd be revival in the church today oh God help me I pastored a couple one time I can say this because I went through it I pastored a couple in this church years ago I'm telling you every time they come to church they had stones in their hands always condemning always criticizing always finding fault with everything it didn't matter what we did they found fault with it you know, and then you know, well, you know what happens when they do that? They try to get their little group together. Oh, come on, say man. You know what I'm talking about. They, they try to divide this group from that group. Always carrying those rocks around. Always ready to bash somebody in. Always finding fault with somebody. I sat them down and counsel with them. I told them you can't do that in this church. It's not going to be permitted out here. You listen to me here tonight. I'd rather have 20 five people uh, that threw the stones down uh, and loved God uh, and loved each other uh, than to have 500 uh, a fussing and a fighting uh, and a criticizing uh, and condemning everything uh, because in that kind of atmosphere uh, every evil work will be in that. Brother Clinton said when he was pastor and he asked an older seasoned pastor he said I want to know the secret to success. How to have a successful church. He said, I know you got to pray. I know you got to fast. I know you got to preach the word. I know all those things. He said that old seasoned preacher told him uh, the way to have a successful church uh, is knowing who not to let stay. Some people are not there uh, to help the church along. 
Some people are not there, you know, lined up with the vision of that church. Some people are there just to cause problems. Some people there are just to be critical. Some people are there just to find fault. I'm telling you there's a Judas in every church except this church. I said there's a Judas in every church except for the South Ashboro Church of God. Give God a hand of praise. Aren't you glad there's no Judas here? And if I find out you are, it's going to be bad news for you. Amen. And I got tired of it, Brother Albright. I got tired of them hurting people in this church. I got tired of them trying to group up people. I, I mean, they, they turned against others in this church. I, they turned against the pastor of this church. I, they, they, you know, everything we did, I, they threw stones at it I, until finally I told God. I, I said, Lord, I, I'm done with this. I, I'm done with them. I've tried to help them. I, I've tried to love them. I, I've tried to instruct them. I, but they won't drop the stones. I, so God, if they're not going to change, I, get them out of this church. You say, Brother Shelton, that's harsh. Well, let me tell you something. you got to be bad for me to pray that kind of prayer on you. But listen to me. That kind of cancer, it destroys the unity of a church. And when the unity is destroyed, the all's gone. The spirit leaves and revival cannot come. They called me. Woo! You want me to tell you who it is, don't you? They called me one night and said, well, Brother Shelton, we're not going to be coming back. I said, thank you, Jesus, for answering my prayer. Thank you for getting that cancer out of this church. Thank you for getting those accusers of the brethren out of this church. Thank you for getting those stone casters out of this church. Sister Sharon, I don't know where they might be right now, but if they didn't repent, they're somewhere else in somebody else's church carrying the same old stones. But thank God it's not in this church anymore. I'm just telling you tonight, if we're going to have revival, we're going to have to have unity. And to have unity... I've got to say, God, I'm the one wrong. Help me to get it right, and I'll help others in the way. Raise your hands and praise him tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, my, 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 my. He said, you have to know who not to let stay. The moment I hung up the phone, I had just pulled into my driveway. Brother Charlie, I'm telling you, heaven come down and kissed me on the top of my head. You say, what do you mean? The Holy Ghost fell on me right there inside of my vehicle. I, I had to pl I put my brake on. I stopped right there in my driveway. Uh, and, and the Holy Ghost began to speak through me. I, I felt heaven come down. I, I thought, thank you, Lord. You're the great physician. Uh, and you still know how to eradicate cancer. I, I said, you still know how to remove uh, spiritual cancer uh, from your body. Can you say amen tonight? Uh, listen to me. Uh, Jesus said, uh, before you criticize your brother, uh, before before you condemn your sister before you judge somebody else he said let, the, let God work on that beam in your eye let the Lord get you lined up and when you get lined up you won't have a critical spirit but you'll have a loving spirit that'll say I'm here to help you I'll pray for you I'm not going to push you down I'm going to help lift you up Give him praise tonight. Woo! When we get right with God, and I see somebody struggling. I see a weaker brother or sister. When I get things right in my heart, I'm not going to look at them the same way. I'm not going to look at them to criticize them. I'm not going to run around and find somebody and let me talk to you about them so and so. Sometimes we think nobody knows our conversation, but God hears every one of them. And the Bible said we'll give an account before God for every idle word that we speak. 
Don't that cause fear to rise up in you? The Bible said it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Be careful, little tongue, what you say. I believe David Wilkerson preached a message one time called that. Be careful, little tongue, what you say. Be careful how you criticize others. Be careful how you find fault. I've always heard it said that fault findings of the devil. Anybody ever heard that? The devil, the Bible said in Revelation, is an accuser of the brethren. He's always pointing that finger in accusations against other people. David became angry. I got to hurry. God help me. David became angry and said, This man's going to pay for his sins. This man's not going to get by. Just look at what this sinful man has done to this innocent man. Surely he's going to die for this. In 2 Samuel 12 and 7, Nathan the prophet looked at David and he said, You are the man. Now David's going to have to deal with that beam in his own eye. David's going to have to deal with his own sin. David's been confronted by his sin now. It was him who had taken a man's wife. It was him who had that man killed. It was him all along who had disobeyed God. David had been so busy judging and condemning and criticizing others. But now through the word of God, David finally sees himself and the wretched condition that he's in. Thank God that the word will show us where we are and the word will show us what we are. Hebrews 4 and 12 said the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now David's heard the word. Now the word has showed David what He is. Now David admits his own failures. David now, rather than condemning somebody else, rather than criticizing somebody else, rather than ready to throw a stone at somebody else, now David admits, I'm the one that's been wrong all along. Boy, it's hard to get church people to say that. It ain't no problem to get people to tell you what's wrong with others. But it sure is hard to get Christians to say, you know what? I'm the one wrong. I know you weren't going to shout a whole lot with that one. I'm the one wrong. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. It's me, God. They may have a speck in their eye. But dear God, I've got stones in my hand and a six by six log in my eye that I need to get right now David sees where he is finally David now can finally see himself and what he's done verse 13 said and David said unto Nathan I have sinned against the Lord how many Christians do you know say that today oh they'll say did you hear what they did did you see what they did nod your head you bunch of sanctified people You see how they're doing? Can you believe they did that? But David finally come to the place that every one of us has got to come to. David finally saw David. Now he's not looking at anybody else. I told you in the first part of this message, I'm a full-time job for me. I don't have time. You know, my calling as a shepherd is to watch over this flock, but I'm telling you, I'm a full-time position for me. It It takes everything I've got to keep me. Make sure I'm in line. Make sure I'm doing right. Come on, say amen. Now David responds the proper way when he's confronted with the beam in his own eye, his own sin. Now he drops the stones he was ready to throw at somebody else. David immediately left his throne and he came down from his high position. 
You know, many people today won't respond to the prompting of the Spirit of God because it means we have to humble ourselves and come down from where we think we ought to be. Churches are full of people that are full of pride and spiritual arrogance, and it's hard for them to humble down and say, I'm the one that's wrong. I'm the one that's been sinning. I'm the one that needs forgiveness. I'm the one that needs to be washed by the blood of the Lamb. Some people will never get this because they're always so busy pointing the finger at everybody else. Even when God tries to deal with them through His Word, even when the Spirit prompts them, they ignore it and they grieve the Spirit of God because they will not see their own faults. David, the last thing he was concerned about, I'm getting ready to close. Say amen. <laughs> the last thing David was concerned about was his throne. What David was concerned about was his relationship with God. The last thing David was concerned about was his role in the church. The last thing David was concerned about was his title in the church. The last thing David was concerned about of what other people might think about him. David now when he sees where he is, he is concerned about his relationship and making sure that everything is right between me and my God. I'm just telling you tonight, amen. Every one of us have to come to that place that we have to humble ourselves in the sight of God and say, Lord, examine me. Show me me. Let me see what's wrong. And if you show me, I'll get it right. I'll repent. And then I can help somebody else in the way. There can be no better place for us to start than in the house of the Lord. The church is still a hospital for the sin sick soul. The church is still a place where Christians can come and get healing. For their sin sickness at times. The church is a play where the place where the living blood flows. The church is where I find the blood that gives me strength from day to day. The blood of Jesus will never, ever, ever lose his power. Sister, if you'll come and get ready to play, don't play yet. I got just another minute or two here. The first step to our restoration is admitting first that I'm the one wrong. It was wrong for me to talk about them. The Bible said if you have a problem with your brother and sister, you don't go to somebody else, you go to them. We're preaching about holiness here tonight. We're preaching about being sanctified. Can you imagine what would happen to the churches if people lived by that? If they quit running to everybody else to run somebody down and they just go that one they have the problem with the whole time, just go straight to them and talk to them, get, get in the altar, get in the blood. Can you imagine the kind of unity? Brother Benny, I, I've been pastoring a long time and I've had people look me in my face and tell me how much they love me, how much they love my family. What a wonderful preacher you are. What a wonderful pastor. And then it got back to me. I don't know why it always gets back to you. And it gets back to you, that same person was running you down like a dog to somebody else. I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they wouldn't do that. Run you down like a dog. And we wonder why we can't have revival in the churches today. Look a man right in their eyes and tell him how wonderful you are. You're such a wonderful, I love you so much. You, you're just such a wonderful person. And can't even get home quick enough and can't get don't even wait to get the house, get on that phone with somebody else in that church. I want to run them down and talk bad about them. I ain't been talking none to you. I've just been talking to him. If you ain't guilty, you ought to smile at me. And if you are, smile and fake it. I've had that happen. I've had people run me and my family down. After telling me how what a wonderful person. You're just such a great, great pastor. And I'll go throw stones at me and my family to somebody else. In that local church. I didn't come to preach that. That was just free. The first step in the process has to be admit that I'm wrong. 
and drop the stone. David never tried to make any excuses for his sin. David admitted his guilt. He admitted his transgressions. He didn't come up with any reasons that would excuse him for his sins. David confessed his sins before the Lord. What happened? What happened to a brother going to another brother if they've been offended? Isn't that Bible, Brother Benny? You, you, you've studied the Bible. You went to Bible school and everything. Isn't that what the Bible says? And the Bible says, if you have aught with your brother, don't you go to them. Leave your gift at the altar and go to the old brother and make that right. Isn't that what the Bible says? Is anybody else reading the same Bible I'm reading? Boy, I can tell some of, this, some of you this thing's a bite you hard. The Bible says if you have aught with your brother, you go to that brother. And you make that right. If you have aught with that sister, you go to that sister. You see how holy we, we, we think we are sometimes and really when God's word talks to us we realize how, how really far away we are from what God wants us to be. Well, see, man, I'm about to finish and it's going to get better. God restored David. David repented. He said, Lord, I was wrong. I sinned. I was ready to kill somebody else for what I'd done. All the while it was me. All the while I was the one wrong. I wonder why we always quick to look for the negative in people. Why are, we always, why are we always quick to think the worst about people? Sis Shelton, am I doing okay? Because it got real, real quiet in here. Why do we always look, think the worst of somebody? Why, why do we do that? And then we run to somebody else and have that jaw party. But God takes a note of every bit of it. We better be careful about jaw parties. Why don't we always think the worst? Even y'all got quiet up here. David, play softly please, sister. David was restored because he repented. As a memorial to God's saving grace, David wrote the entire 51st Psalm. Go home, read it tonight. This was David's memorial to God. It was a song of praise and thanksgiving for the forgiveness and compassion and mercy. God could have killed David right there in his tracks. And by the law, David deserved to die. But God showed him mercy. And Nathan said, God said, you're not going to die. You've repented. You're going to suffer the rest of your life. You're going to pay for it the rest of your days. David was forgiven. Before we're quick to point the finger at others, we ought to first clean up the mess in our own lives. I read these two stories I thought were very interesting. One said in, in his little book of illustrations of Bible truth, H.A. Ironside pointed out the folly of judging others. He related an incident in the life of a man named Bishop Potter. Bishop Potter was sailing for Europe on one of the great transatlantic ocean liners. When he went on board, he found that another passenger was to share the cabin with him. After going to look at the accommodations, he came up to the desk clerk and asked if he could leave his gold watch and some other valuables in the ship's safe. He explained that ordinarily he never used the ship's safe, but he'd been to his cabin and he had met the man who was to occupy the other berth. Judging from his appearance, he was afraid that he might not be a very trustworthy person. The preacher went into the cabin, saw the man he was going to bunk with, and he thought he didn't look like a savory character. So he went up to the desk and he gave the clerk, or the, the clerk there, the ship's clerk, he gave him his gold watch and some other items to put in a safe because he was afraid that man might steal them. As that desk clerk placed the man's valuables in the safe, he remarked, he said, not a problem, Bishop. I'll be very glad to take care of them for you. The other man's already been up here and left his for the same reason. See what happens when we judge and criticize and condemn. He looked at that man, criticized him, judged him, sized him up, said, I better not leave my stuff in here. 
But that man done the same thing. That man was a preacher. He was a bishop. I read the story. I know you're ready to go home. Stand, please. We've all met those kind of people. We've all met people who are ju always judging and criticizing and condemning others and throwing stones. And I read the story this week of an evangelist that was standing on the back door. Standing at the back door with the pastor after the service shaking hands with the people as they left. This little boy walked up to that evangelist and this is what he said. He said, that was the poorest sermon I've ever heard. A few minutes later, the same little boy came through the line again and said, you'll never preach in this church again, evangelist. A few minutes later, that same little boy came through the same line and again, he said, you won't get much of an offering. The pastor standing behind, beside the evangelist, hearing the little boy say these things, he looked at that evangelist and said, listen, don't pay him any mind. He just always goes around repeating what he's heard here. We laugh about that and think that's funny. But that kind of stuff goes on week in and week out in churches among people of God, people that are supposed to be Christians. Is it any wonder we can't have revival today, Brother Albright? Where there's envy and strife, where there's division, where there's criticism and there's condemnation all the time and fault finding all the time. Every evil work is present. Paul said, let a man examine himself. Every one of us must look inwardly. Make sure that we're in the faith the proper way before we ever try to help somebody else in the faith. Jesus said in verse 5 of Matthew 7, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. I just want to raise a question here tonight to every one of us in this service, everyone watching online, what is that in your eye? What is that in your eye? You sit around and look for fault, you'll find fault. If you want to find it, you ain't got to look long. Everybody's got it. Everybody's got it. If that's what you're looking for. It won't take you long before you'll be able to find a whole list of things you don't like about somebody else, a brother or sister in Christ. Do you just remember what Jesus said? Before you're going to throw a stone at them, before you're going to criticize them, before you're going to condemn them, before you're going to judge them, why don't you take a look in the mirror at your own life? What's that in your eye, saint of God? How many here tonight by a raise Sam and say, Brother Shelton, I just need to ask the Lord just to wash me and cleanse me real good. Oh, come on, come on, you bunch of saved people. I'm not saying you're not saved. David was a man after God's own heart. But David's ready to kill another man over. <laughs> All the while it was David. We're hard on other people, but easy on ourselves. Some preachers won't preach certain things because they're doing those things. What is that in your eye tonight? Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I didn't come for applaud or fanfare tonight. I preach what I feel like you've said to me. Thank you for helping me, Lord. Thank you for talking to me and preaching this message to me first. I pray, God, that you'll help me and help everyone in this house and all those watching online. Forgive us of the things that we've said. Forgive us of the way that we've hurt others. Forgive us of the way that we've criticized and we have found fault and condemned and judged our own brothers and sisters in the faith. Forgive us of our failure to do it the right way, the way the Word of God says. 
Oh, set a guard upon our lips. Let there be a constant ritual, ritual, ritual over our mouth. Help me with this little member in my body that can be destructive and do damage and irreparable damage. Sanctify my tongue, oh God. Sanctify this little member in my mouth, oh God. Lord, before you sanctify my tongue, you must first sanctify my heart because out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth speaks. So reach on past my tongue tonight, God, and sanctify my heart again, oh Lord. Cleanse me, oh Lord. Forgive me if I've sinned against you. Forgive me if I've sinned against my brother or my sister. God, help me with a beam in my eye. Help me to get that right, Lord, so that when I see a weaker brother or a weaker sister, Lord, my first reaction won't be to criticize or to condemn them or to throw stones at them. But my first reaction will be to pray for them and to reach out in love and help lift them up and help them in the journey. Oh, God. What is that in our eyes? Let the anointing come upon the churches because of the unity. Help us tonight, oh God. Holiness begins in the heart. Lord, help us not forget that. Sure, you sanctify us and make us holy inwardly and outwardly. But it doesn't work from the outside in. It works from the inside out. Forgive us, Lord, if our attitudes have been wrong. Forgive us if we've had all in our heart against a brother or sister. Forgive us, Lord, if we've used our tongue as a weapon against somebody else. This little member in our body is more deadly than a gun or a knife. And it's killed more people. And it's hurt more people. There's been pastors that have left pastorates too soon because of that member in somebody's mouth. There's been members that's gotten out of church because of that little unruly member in our mouth. Help us, God, in our church just to throw the stones down. Fall on our knees, God, and repent of our wrong against you and our wrong against others. Help this nation, God. Help this nation again, Lord. That we once and for all say, that group's not the one wrong. That group's not. We're wrong. And we want to make it right. Send revival to the church. Lord, I felt this thing kick against me tonight, but I'm not afraid of it. I want to see revival. And I pray that all of us, myself included, that we'll all humble ourselves before you like King David. That our concern right now is not the throne, but our concern right now is our relationship with you and our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So before we draw that circle around ourselves and pray for revival, Help us to stand inside that circle and ask God to help us get the beam out of our own eye. What is that in our eye? What is that in your eye? Forgive us of our sins against you. Forgive us for sinning against others. 
Help us to be a holy, sanctified people of God. Let our speech always be seasoned with salt, with the grace of God. Come on, lift your hands and love Him tonight. Lord, help each one of us. Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Help each one of us here. Help each one of us online watching right now, God. At that time, that place, at that moment, when the beams are gone and everything's under the blood, you will pour out, pour out the oil upon that body that's united. The oil will flow. There you will pronounce the blessing. And the winds of revival can blow through that house, through those churches. Do it again, O oh Lord. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Give God a hand of praise tonight. I didn't try to be so long-winded, didn't plan to be. But I was not going home with that one tonight and going to bed. How many want to be holy people? Not just in word, but indeed also that we live right and we love God. The Bible says every idle word. Every idle word we're going to give an account for. Some people just lose it. They just blow their mouth off. They blow their testimony with their mouth. But guard your testimony. It's one of the most valuable things you have in this life is that testimony that I'm right with God and I walk right with God. That's how you'll be a help with somebody else. That's how you'll be a help to a weaker brother or a weaker sister. Amen. Come back on Sunday. Bring somebody with you. Let's be praying for our church. Let's be praying for our services. I want to say this because they're probably watching. Let's be praying for those who are just watching online. I know some can't come. I'm not talking about them. So don't get mad at me. Some can't come right now because of the fear of this, this virus. I ain't pushing nobody. But I told Sister Shelton today, I hope people don't use this as an excuse to be able to say, I'm just not going to be able to come tonight. I'll just watch online. There's nothing like being in the house of God where you can fellowship with brothers and sisters and fellowship with the Lord in His house. Can you say amen? amen? So you ones that can be in church, get back in church like you're supposed to be. Amen? amen. Give you one more hand of praise. Brother Charlie and Brother Zach's coming to get you. Be careful, old little tongue, what you say. Be careful, old little tongue, what you say. Amen? We love you. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday, the Lord willing. The hand of fear gripped the hearts of the crowd that day at Jerry's home. When the doctor shook his head and said she's gone. Oh, you could feel that the matter was hopeless. You could hear them cry that night. That little girl was only 12 years old. Oh, then somewhere in the distance, out lying against the sun, there came a man on a mission from the throne. Oh, and then they said, look, somebody's coming. But what they did not know, it was a promise coming down that dusty road. Oh, there's a promise coming down that dusty road. From his holy hands, he delivered to the Lord. He's got the key to what you need. Death and hell he will defeat. There's a promise coming.
Peter turned to mocking when Jesus did speak. He said, your daughter's not dead, she's just asleep. Then he turned to those unbelievers and he told them to all go home. That's when they heard him say, leave me in death alone. Well, then he laid his holy hands upon the child and he looked death right in the eye. He said, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. And with a voice that sounds like thunder, he hurled death asunder. And then he said, little girl, arise and be healed. There's a promise coming down that dusty road. From his holy hands, he burned to flow. He's got the key to what you need. Turned to mocking when Jesus began to speak. He said, your daughter's not dead, she's only asleep. And then he turned to those unbelievers and he told them to all go home. That's when they heard him say, leave me in death alone. Well, hands upon that child and he looked death right in the eye and he said all power in heaven and earth is given to me and with a 